on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. Joining me once again, and it's always a pleasure, is Professor Richard Wolf. As you know, Richard Wolf is an economist and economic historian, the host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV, and the author of a number of books, the latest of which is The Sickness is the System. So, as always, Richard Wolf, welcome to the Zero Hour. Thank you, RJ. And as always, I'm very glad to be here. One thing that uh, came up in conversation between the two of us off camera, uh, uh, and that is something I've been thinking about, too, is, you know, on this program, I don't talk a lot about Donald Trump and what's going on with him and his various trials and uh, how, what that says about uh, the Republican Party and the state of the economy and society, all that. Uh, partially, I think it's because it seems as if everybody else on the air is talking about it all the time. And we're, we're just inundated with uh, Trump, Trump, Trump all the time, which to me, one of the, so one of the reasons I avoid it is that I think we can't, build the world to come if you will talking about uh, you know this uh, this uh, nudnik from you know who's who's dominating uh, our our consciousness all the time secondly the conversations tend to be run in these very proscribed directions these channels like MSNBC is a channel. They'll tell you, you know, Russia's behind it or whatever they want to say this week. Uh, Fox will say he's, you know, innocent victim of whomever. Uh, and so, you know, I haven't stopped. And I, and you, you're the perfect person to do this with. I haven't stopped and thought about what the phenomenon of Donald Trump and everything we're seeing about that says about society as a whole and people's understanding of their world their economy their level of satisfaction and so on i was wondering if you have any thoughts about that well i start by agreeing with you enormously that i think i and i i believe this is true for most americans are getting more and more bored exhausted tired uh it's not worth it to keep track of the details. It's very difficult to do. Uh, the, the noise factor, the deliberate effort of people on all sides to muddy the water, to rewrite the script so that there is a super good guy over here and a super evil guy over there, which is a childish way of dealing with complicated questions. That's the level of discourse, and it is turning people off more and more. And I don't know how that will play out in terms of the voting, uh, and, and I'm not all that interested in that either. But what's more interesting to me and what I hope we can talk a little bit about is what you said a moment ago in passing, which is what does it tell us uh, about our society and the world we live in that we have uh, a character like Donald Trump rising to that level of political importance in the society? What does it mean that, that the old establishment is trying to crush and demonize him uh, in this rather childish way? Uh, and, and what does it mean that we have a choice if today's polls are to be assumed uh, to stay the way they are, that we will have a choice between two very old, very tired, very limited white businessmen and politicians and that's going to be the choice we are forced to make what does that tell us about an exhausted empire a declining system etc those for me are the interesting questions and uh, just as an aside, and people will get mad at me for saying this, but I have to say that, look, I I'm old, getting older next week, so I'm not ageist, but I am concerned about Biden's cognition, not because every man of his age or every person of his age has problems with cognition, cognition but I do wonder in his case, I have to be candid, uh, he, uh, uh, Trump, has issues of his own and i think i am not the only one who looks at these two 
people and says out of what 345 million americans these are the two finest examples exemplars we can put up what does that mean what does that say and yet if one says in the current discourse we ought to have more choices than this uh one the hypothetical one runs the risk of being roundly chastised for irresponsibility so that puts us in a a, a kind of uh can't win no win situation where we're not even permitted to explore alternatives without or discuss alternatives without somehow uh you know they say don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good but now it's don't let the mediocre be the enemy of the awful or something you know and so i feel there is always time to talk about what's wrong with this framework that we're operating in and what might be done to make it better yeah i, I again i could not agree more i i do find it interesting I must admit that the effort in the Democratic Party to offer something new and different, namely Bernie Sanders, uh, was squashed systematically from day one by the dominant forces in the Democratic Party. And they succeeded in doing that so that he's not even running uh, this time, uh, having done so twice. By contrast, in the Republican Party, somebody who offers something different from the usual stodgy Republican offering, um, the attempt to squash him, which the old establishment of the Republican Party certainly did, failed. And so they have had to come to terms with somebody who, it's not that he isn't a re an old Republican, he is. But the old Republicans were, you know, the old business community as the major player and the, the docile evangelicals and gun lovers and, and racists who went along because for them, the Republicans were better than the Democrats. For the first time in a long time, a Republican makes the race based on those who were secondary before and is able to prevail because he can get the numbers and that's mr mr trump we don't know if if bernie could have done that he might have but the the democratic party was able to squash him the democratic party is trying to do the same thing now with trump uh portraying him as evil 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 as in fact mainstream democrats did to bernie uh, a while back and i'm struck also by the extraordinary similarity between the two parties when it comes to programmatic issues once again these are two parties outdoing one another in being supportive and celebratory for capitalism even though arguably american capitalism both as its economic system and as the center of a global empire are pretty clearly in pretty deep trouble needing all kinds of uh attention and therefore criticism and here's a democratic party and the republican party that will give it support every which way they can think of compete with one another for who's more supportive uh and not utter a word of criticism it's extraordinary uh that it appears, if you look at it from that perspective, that what we have here is a kind of theater, a political theater in which enormous energy is devoted to a certain agreed set of topics, uh, racism, guns, abortion, and so on. And an equal consensus never to bring up the economic system we live in and its enormous troubles as a topic that needs attention and criticism and debate and argument and alternative solutions. It may not be explicit, but it is as jarring to watch the unanimity about capitalism as it is 
to watch the unanimity that we shall only disagree on guns and racism and abortion. Not to say that guns, racism, and abortion are not valid issues to have a debate over. They are. And, but that, that combination, the only thing for me as stunning as that is this for me, and I want to be honest here, the childish tendency in this society all the time and on steroids now to need to look at these issues as though it were God versus the devil. Mm -hmm. There has to be the wonderful goodness on one side, and so it's painted blindly, and the awful, awful evil on the other side. And the way I see it is, that's always been the American way with the rest of the world. America is new and fresh and daring and democratic, and the rest of the world is whatever the awful opposites of those adjectives might be. Stalin was the worst thing that ever happened. Putin is assimilated to Stalin in order to keep that game going. It's never been true. The United States isn't beautiful vanilla and the rest of the world horrible, horrible, ugly. And, and the need to do that obscures understanding, warps decisions, leads to catastrophic mistakes, and yet is held on to as if it were a lifeline in this culture. What, what, there's so many aspects of this I, I, I want to get into with you, but, you know, my friend Thomas Frank, who's been on this program a number of times, written a number of terrific books, including What's the Matter with Kansas and so on, made the great point, uh, and I saw this a lot when I moved from D.C. to suburban D.C., if you're in Chevy Chase, Bethesda, walking around, you see a million uh, yard signs, or you used to, uh, and Tom wrote about this, that say, love is love, uh, we don't care what color you are, you know, we, we don't care what creed you are, all very wonderful and supportive sentiments. There'll be like eight or nine of them on these signs, right, endorsing, you know, rights for LGBTQ and women and, and, and uh, you know, that immigrants are people, all of which I couldn't agree with more. But as Tom points out, there's not a single line that says something like every worker should get an, a living wage or anything economic at all. And the fact is that if you go down that list of everybody who's being showered with love in these signs, right? LGBTQ people, women, uh, immigrants, uh, you know, African-Americans, whomever, most of them have something in common, which is they gotta work for a living. Most of them, all of them have gotta put food on the table. All of them have gotta need shelter and clothing. And yet nothing in there about the issues that so deeply affect all of us on a daily basis. So I guess what I'm driving at is my concern that even though Democrats, let's say, many of them decry Republicans for fighting culture wars, in a sense, they're limiting things to culture wars too. Perhaps this is what you're saying, that, um, uh, you know, they may be on the right side of these culture wars as far as you or I are considered, but they're still limiting it to culture. They're not an identity and those things that may distinguish us as people and identify certain rights that we deserve and, and don't yet have, but not those things that unite us all by class or by need or by ability or anything else. Do you get what I'm driving at? Absolutely. And I, I find it stunning. It it's a it's a refusal to deal with a whole raft of issues and then the meta point namely it's a refusal to deal with that refusal to even ask the question let me give you a concrete example nothing is more common right now than the lament depending on who you are that artificial intelligence is about uh, to descend on the uh, enterprises of of American capitalism and beyond America too, of course, and therefore eliminate hundreds of millions of jobs. All right, this is wonderful. This is 
First of all, nonsense. Why nonsense? Because let's imagine that artificial intelligence allows a person, one person, to do what it used to take two persons to do. And on that basis, when the employer brings the uh, new technology in, the artificial intelligence, uh, that employer fires half the workers um, because he doesn't need them anymore and therefore pockets as his own profit what he would have had to pay them in wages. But the assumption that that's what has to happen is wrong because obviously there's an alternative. You could bring in artificial intelligence, which doubles every worker's productivity, and handling it by cutting every worker's workday in half. You don't come for eight hours, you come for four. And with artificial intelligence, you can produce as much in four hours as it used to take you eight to do. That's another way of managing the technology. If you had an economic system that could do it that way, you would. If you had an economy based on worker co-ops, they would, or at least they could. We don't know what decisions democratically they would make, but that would be one of their options. That's never discussed. You deal with AI as if the social cost of it is unemployment. Since bringing AI in is only done if and when it enhances the profit of the employer, since it's the employer who decides what technology is used, what you're really saying is, here's a technology which employers will be able to use to enhance their profits. The side effect will be massive unemployment. Now, if you were even honest enough to say what I just said, then there would, you can be sure, be a debate. So you can't say that. You have to say that the issue here is, what are we going to do to help those poor unfortunates because their unemployment is somehow built in as if it were a, a natural phenomenon? For me, this is a sign of a society so corrupted in its mind that it cannot allow a whole raft of actual options to even be discussed. They not only are never brought for a vote, they are never discussed, they are never expressed as an option. The implications of choosing between that and an alternative, none of that is allowed. And all participants, Republicans and Democrats alike, accept that, reproduce it, repeat it, thereby make it even more real, and neither them, neither of them acknowledges the solidarity they have. It's like that moment, I believe it was in the 2020 race, when a supporter of uh, Bernie Sanders, a, a student at a college, uh, listened to a speech by Nancy Pelosi, and he raised his hand at the time of questions, and asked her about the Democratic Party's position on capitalism or some words like that. And you, and because it's video, you watch Nancy Pelosi's face. This was not a question she expected. Her face indicates she didn't know what to say. She took a very long time kind of rolling her eyes and trying to come up with an answer. And what finally came out of her mouth as it was becoming embarrassing that she could not respond, I mean, she wasn't ill or anything, she just didn't know what to say. She, what came out of her mouth was, I quote, but, comma, we are all capitalists now, which I congratulate her. That is honest, that is true, but it shows she has no idea anymore of how to answer a young person's question, what is your position on capitalism? That, that is so far foregone, that has been so buried that there is no longer a space even to think in some minimally intelligent way how to answer a perfectly reasonable question.
If I recall that video correctly, her the, the next sentence uh, uh, she spoke was, um, that's just the way it is. That yeah, she then yeah, went on to say, that's just the way it is. In other words, we don't question it. You know, uh, we have always been at war with uh, Eurasia or whatever that uh, Orwell quoted. But that brings up a really important point in, in the entire conversation about uh, Trump versus the Democrats. And, and I have to admit, Richard Wolf, I, you know, I care about the interims, uh, you know, uh, non-systemic things that might be better under the Democrats. I mean, I don't dismiss that easily. I mean, that's a tough call sometimes if, if Republicans are going to do more to cut social services, even than has been done up to now, and so on. But what struck me so much about uh, especially the, the Trump Hillary Clinton race, and uh, to a lesser extent, but also the uh, the Trump Biden race, uh, was when Trump came on the scene. There were what? There were uh, two ca two candidates running for the Democratic primary. Martin O'Malley quickly dropped out, and then twelve on the Republican side or something. Trump was the only one who consistently, and people talk about the racist appeals, and I get, I, of course, in the uh, xenophobia, and I get that too. And uh, but he was the only one who talked about people's jobs. Was he lying? Yes, I think he was lying. Was he insincere? Yes, I think he was insincere. But he was the only one who would say, first of all, only one on the Republican stage to say, "All these guys want to cut your social security. I won't do it." Number one. Number two. They took your jobs away. I'm going to bring them back. Number three, these wars in the Middle East cost a fortune and they're stupid and I would have never done it, which is a lie because I think he was supportive of them at the time. But still, he was the only one. And, and uh, you know, when it got down to Trump versus Clinton, she had a very hard time articulating what she would do to make people's lives better. Trump was offering something, including, you know, the kind of uh, street level, screw those guys who screwed you kind of thing that is a form of response to people's economic suffering. So it seems to me, uh, it seems to me that there is now, I know the Democrats, uh, you know, Biden tried to do more of it. Perhaps that's why he, he prevailed in uh, 2020. But, you know, I think there is this discomfort uh, really among both parties, but uh, now especially among Democrats because the Republicans have established a kind of populism. I like populism, by the way. Uh, if you study the history of American populism, it's a very powerful thing. I like left populism, but there's this discomfort with appealing uh, on the part now more of Democrats than Republicans it used to be both of appealing to the quote unquote rabble. I think it's kind of a Hamiltonian leftover. No wonder they loved the musical so much. But um, this discomfort was saying, yeah, you've been ripped off and we're going to do something about it because uh, you know, even Iran, and then I'll stop talking, but even Ron DeSantis in Florida, you know, uh, feuding with uh, Disney. Um, I can't, you know, it's hard for me to picture any Democrat feuding with any corporation for any, even the best of reasons. So, you know, I think that's something that's missing in their repertoire. Uh, but what do you think? Is it missing? And if so, why do you suppose that is? Yeah, I think it's missing in the Democratic Party because the particularly the leadership and the center of the Democratic Party have taken their working class support for granted for a very long time. And I understand why. Uh, you had a kind of radical Bernie Sanders type of leadership under Franklin Roosevelt. You were able to mobilize the working class to support the Democrat there on a scale that had never been seen before, really solid alliance, if you like, so-called New Deal coalition and so on. Everybody on the left enthusiastic to work with and in the working class for the Democrats. And they've been riding on that association ever since. They deliver less and less 
but they hold on to it thanks to the Republicans usefully and conveniently saying whatever the Democrats may no longer be doing for you, we will do even less. What, what Trump did was reverse that story and say, no, we will do more. And that becomes dangerous for the Democratic Party because a, a, a moment may be, may be reached, and I believe it happened with Clinton versus Trump, when the Democrats offered so little that the Republican bloviator, even though there was no reason to believe he would follow through, and he proved he would not, but they could believe they got better rhetoric, at least out of uh, Trump, than they were getting out of the Democrats who, who, who didn't seem to think they needed to bother. The, the popular image of the Democratic Party being uh, concerned about women, being concerned about non-whites, being concerned about immigrants, that is a response to, to 50 years of declining responsiveness of the Democratic Party to a working class base. That's why you can say correctly that where's the economics here? I mean, if the best Mr. Biden can do, and, and it is the best, is tell us over and over again about how he passed uh, the Inflation Recovery Act or the Infrastructure Act. Look, the w Americans understand that's an enormous amount of money being turned over overwhelmingly to the largest corporations in the United States the ones who build the railroads or to rebuild the cities or to put electric, uh, the internet in every community or whatever it is you're going to do in those programs, you're handing the money to big corporations and everybody knows what they will do. They will economize on the portion of that they give to workers in order to maximize the portion of that that makes them a profit, which will be paid to the CEOs and the shareholder. In other words, you're not changing the America of unequal development, of inequality. You're funding it. That's what the Democrats do. The difference with Trump in 2017, he gave the same huge corporations a tax cut that magnified their profits. So in the end, the Republicans serve the big companies by cutting their taxes, and the Democrats fund the same companies by spending lavishly on them. And they, that the mass of people feel left out by this politics is a sign that they understand what's going on, that they don't bother to vote in huge numbers is also a reflection of the sense of futility. What difference does it make? And I understand it makes some differences. You've outlined those regions. Those issues are important. But in terms of the fundamental economics, and let me quote again, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Bill Clinton. It's the economy, stupid. And in the end, it'll be the economy that undoes this unholy alliance of Republicans and Democrats to define what is and isn't appropriate for their battles with one another. And they can demonize one for being a racist and demonize the other one for being whatever it is that you can think of. You're in bed with Putin, you evil, awful, you know, you are, you are, you, and the, and to hear night after night on, on the Democratic side, the, the demonization of Mr. Uh, Trump, it, you know, it. I find this, again, a level of childish misunderstanding and then to, if, if it ends up that we're going to have the demonization of Trump versus the demonization of, of Hunter Biden and by implication his father, then we'll see to the absurd end that we will then have an election and choose a leader based on the relative voting power of two alternative demonizations. I mean, this, this is really shoddy kind of of politics. It, it befits a society that is no longer able to cope with its real problems and so has a kind of theatric uh, to carry sure. out an as-if politics uh, as, as, a, as a screen so we don't have to face 
the real problems that we have. Not long after Trump was elected, I wrote a piece with the first sentence, I think, was don't just tell me what you're against. Tell me what you're for. But the, the convenient function that Trump serves is that it's enough to be against him because he's so hateful. But if you buy into my purpose of life is to defeat this one enemy, then the enemy of the enemy is my friend, which in this case includes the FBI, the CIA, uh, corporate CEOs who Ron DeSantis thinks are too woke, and you wind yourself, wind up uh, in certain corners of certain political parties, embracing the people that you once rightfully questioned uh because they were enforcing an unjust system and still are in the united states around the world and that's how you why you have so much of a thirst for military intervention among democrats now um uh, rather than republicans and i fear that uh, you know everybody asks where are the ant where's the anti-war left well it's you know it's it's cheering you know nuclear brinksmanship uh on the russian border so uh, i don't know where all this ends but i feel that that opposing trump is not nearly enough that without a positive vision i mean fdr may have said nasty things about socialists from time to time but he tried to articulate the concept that liberty was not just an individual right communities had liberties too liberties to protect themselves from pollution and and predation and and those sorts of things uh in order to provide security for its members but uh i i don't get the sense that there's any positive vision out there now uh other than occasionally uh, somebody will say something good about a government program, but almost apologetically. So I guess, you know, I mean, that's my closing thought, but I really feel that, you know, maybe the system doesn't permit one of the two political parties to speak positively about alternatives, but somebody has to, and I'll give you the last word. So, yeah, no, let me be a little bit provocative in closing. There are many aspects to the, the war in ukraine i understand that and i'm not summarizing but i want to give one positive kind of connection between that and what we've been talking about the demonization of mr putin to make him another stalin is consistent with polling that shows that a huge percentage of the american people are not aware that the soviet union and Russia are references to a socialist system and a system now that is not only not socialist, but is deeply opposed to the socialist phrase of its own. And that, therefore, the fight against Russia isn't the fight that it was during the Cold War. It's a, the fact that what I've just said is true means that what you've done again is you've demonized your opponent. You have set up the issue as though goodness is on one side and evil is on the other, and you're mobilizing your people to look at the issue that way and therefore to spend, and I learned that this morning, $130 billion, that's the total amount the U.S. has spent on that war already, to argue that this should happen rather than ask what $130 billion could do for the major problems this society has, that that isn't a discussion, is an amazing failure of politics to be what's important, to be the debating about how we decide how to use our resources. This is an amazing. Yesterday, a leading NATO official had to made the bad mistake of saying that the solution in U Ukraine will be that Ukraine has to give up territory to Russia in return for Russia allowing Ukraine to be a part of Western Europe, NATO, EU, and th the specifics aren't important. But they're thinking of how to solve the problem. All the taboo is gone. It's an arrangement. Whereas in the United States, Puritan morality dichotomy is all the rage, and we don't discuss it. We just spend the money killing the people of Ukraine on a massive scale. 
when everybody else, the Russians included, are looking to make a deal here to get this thing over with. This is not a good sign. This is a sign of a society whose politics is so far out of whack with the real issues it has that it is, in fact, creating, as it would in the business world, a vacuum and a whole new kind of politics, either of the left or of the right, is going to come in and fill that politics. And I think it'll blow the Republicans and Democrats right out of the water because of the absurdity of the phony politics they have pursued. <laughs> Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there uh, for now. But Richard Wolf, uh, economist, economic historian, host of Economic Update, as always, a uh, pleasure speaking with you. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. My pleasure as well. And I look forward to when we resume in a couple of weeks. As do I. And we will resume right after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.